Okay, <clears throat> as I said, we are now uh, moving into uh, the theological part of the course, uh, basically <clears throat> talking about John Wesley's order of salvation and walking through the order of salvation with every step along the way. <clears throat> and I think um, two questions that Wesley had in mind when he's thinking about salvation uh, is, first of all, how do I become a Christian? How do I become a Christian? And then, well, I should stop there and say, for many people, that's the only question they're asking. How do I become a Christian? Okay. But <clears throat> then Wesley is also asking another question. How do I remain a Christian? Because not everyone who starts out finishes the race, so to speak, if you know what I'm saying. So <clears throat> this is Wesley the Arminian, because Wesley, contrary to some of the teaching of Calvinism, believed that a person could be truly born of God and then fall away, fall away from the faith. That's a possibility, okay? Uh, other traditions do not acknowledge that. Uh, if they fall away, they, then they go back and say, oh, they were never really born of God. They do that kind of thing, okay? Uh, Wesley doesn't. Wesley recognizes that you can be a real Christian, justified, born of God, and then fall away, apostatize, even reject and renounce Jesus Christ. It's a possibility. Yes, yes, it is a possibility. And so <clears throat> we, Wesley has two questions, not simply how do I become a Christian, but how do I remain, how do I thrive, how do I flourish as a Christian? How do I grow? How do I grow in the knowledge and love of God? Okay. Now, <clears throat> we should say, you know, at the outset here, uh, early, early on, we should say that Wesley was not a systematic theologian, the way we might consider systematic theology today, that Wesley was more focused than that, and also Wesley was more practical. And so we talk about John Wesley as a theologian. I think that's appropriate. I think we can talk about Wesley as a theologian. Uh, and he certainly has written important theological pieces uh, which give rise to his theology. Uh, but it is a practical theology. It is a practical theology. It's not systematic theology in the sense he's trying to integrate all of the Christian faith with all of human knowing, you know, that grand enterprise you know, from the doctrine uh, of God, the doctrine of creation, the doctrine of God, and every step along the way to glory. He's not doing that. He's not doing that. He's much more focused that he is practically concerned. So I think one way of expressing the kind of theology that John Wesley is doing, it is theology in the service of the church in mission, okay? So that it's a very active sort of thing. Theology, practical theology, serves the church, serves the church in her mission in terms of uh, proclaiming the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. And so <clears throat> with that more practical focus, uh, Albert Outler has referred to John Wesley as a folk theologian, call him a folk theologian. In other words, theology for the people. 
theology for the people, theology for the people who are in the church. Uh, I like to call him, <clears throat> sometimes I, I use this expression, I call him a theologian of the auto salutis, uh, meaning that, and what I mean by that <clears throat> is that in this area, in this very special area of an order of salvation, how do I become a Christian? How do I remain a Christian? There are few people who have thought through that uh, more carefully than John Wesley. He thought through that very carefully. Uh, how do I come to receive the grace of God? Uh, how do I become a child of God? Um, how uh, may my heart be purified by the grace of God? Those are all questions that John Wesley, that John Wesley asked, gave attention to, um, and pursued, pursued quite, quite well. Now, we start out, of course, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> something in my throat there. Um, we start out, of course, uh, with creation. Uh, we start out with creation, um, the goodness of God in bringing forward the creation and bringing forth the creation. That's where we begin. Uh, and if you take a look at that sermon that we talked about in last session, that is salvation by faith, the one Wesley preached shortly after his Aldersgate experience, if you look in that sermon, uh, you will see that Wesley also refers to God as a creator, talks about the creation in terms of free grace. Free grace in the sense that creation is a gift. It is a sheer, utter gift. God gives us life. God brings humanity into being. Um, in a real sense, uh, understood in terms of free grace, creation, the bringing into being is the work of God alone. If God might not have decided to create, and that would be, that would be fine as well. God has the freedom to create or no. But God brings creation into being some theologians have argued as an expression of the divine love, as the outflowing of the divine love. And Wesley understands creation specifically as a species of free grace. It is a sheer gift of God uh, that God creates. Uh, it's a sheer gift of a sovereign God who brings forward, brings forth the creation. Now, <clears throat> in creating humanity... In creating humanity, uh, humanity, we are complex beings. We are complex beings, meaning that there are many dimensions to who we are as persons. Uh, and I know that will run counter to what some people are teaching about what it is to be a human being. <laughs> They're teaching in a very diminished way, uh, in a very reduced way of what a human being is. But Wesley is going to have all the dimensions, really, in a full orb sense. Uh, and so I can say at the outset, to be a human being, to be created in the image and likeness of God is a glorious thing. It's glorious. It's a thing of wonder, a thing of beauty, because we are in that image of the God who has created us. Okay? We have been created in, the Latin phrase would be the imago Dei, the imago Dei, the image of God. Okay? And it's, <clears throat> it's a glorious image. Now, Wesley writes about the image of God this glorious image in which we have been created in a threefold sense, in a threefold sense. So he talks about the image of God, first of all, in terms of the natural image, the natural image. That means, <coughs> excuse me, 
excuse me, that we are a spiritual being. We're not simply bodies. We have a spirit to us. We have a soul. We have soulish life, which we enjoy. We are spiritual beings, not simply homo sapiens, but homo spiritualis, that we are spiritual beings. We participate in a spiritual dimension, if you will, that we can, by grace, know and love God, discern, discern the presence of spirit. We can do that as human beings. We participate in those realities. We are a spiritual being <clears throat> who has understanding. So we have understanding. We think of human beings as having reason. They have understanding. They have reason. Uh, but then they also have a will. They have a will, which we've been talking about earlier, and that will is made up of what? The will is made up of the tempers and dispositions that we were talking about yesterday. The tempers and dispositions of the heart. Those orientations to objects of love and desire. Okay, uh, And so we are created in the natural image, uh, first of all, in the sense that we are spiritual beings. We can participate uh, in spiritual realities. We can also uh, transcend ourselves in terms of an appreciation of beauty, even in terms of aesthetic experience, aesthetic experience. Uh, and then beyond this, in terms of the natural image, in other words, beyond understanding or reason, beyond the will in terms of the tempers and dispositions, there is liberty, there is freedom. There is liberty and a measure of freedom. Okay? And that is going to be very essential to who we are as persons. Because freedom is going to be important to understand uh, what it is to be a person. What it is to be a person, especially someone created in the image and likeness of God. <clears throat> then we are created in the Imago Dei in a second way. In a second way, there is the political image. The political image. Uh, and that simply means that we are vice regents in the world. In other words, that through humanity, in some sense, God is exercising God's rule over the rest of creation through humanity, who represents the vice regents of God. In other words, we are governors of this lower world. Now you think of the animal realm, for example, that we are the governors of the animal realm. And that uh, has been established by God in terms of the political image, the political image which makes up a part of the Imago Dei. And then lastly, uh, human beings have been created in the moral image, the moral image, the moral image of God, which bespeaks of righteousness and true holiness. So humanity, in its innocence, at the beginning, humanity has been created in righteousness and true holiness. Righteousness and true holiness. Okay? Now, Wesley seems to imply uh, in his sermon, if this is a much later sermon, The General Deliverance, uh, that um, uh, the significant image, the significant image is the moral image, is the moral image. In some sense, he underscores that, not to neglect the importance of the natural image, but he does underscore the moral image, at least in this particular sermon. Uh, and what he is saying there in terms of the moral image that humanity, humanity is capable of God. 
Humanity is capable of God. I hear sometimes discussions, uh, especially among scientists today, and they say, oh, there's very little difference between human beings and the rest of the animal realm. They're just the same, just the same. Oh, and the big difference is not language because animals use language as well. Although I've been doing lots of reading in linguistics, uh, and I don't think other animals use language the way humans use language because I'm thinking about your thinking of my thinking of you, okay? I'm doing that right now. Uh, I can go up all those levels. That's a very human thing to do, okay? Uh, a very human thing to do. But Wesley doesn't base it there. He doesn't base it on reason. He doesn't base it on homo sapiens being able to use language. That's the key difference between us and the rest of the animal realm. No, here's the difference. Human beings, homo sapiens, are the only species who worship God, who worship God, yes. No animal, no elephant, no porpoise participates in the worship and glory of God in this spiritual dimension, which we, because we're created in the natural image, partake of spiritual things. We know spiritual things. It's a part of the dimension of our own being. As I said before, we have a soul, and that soul is 50,000 fathoms deep, created uh, in the image of our source. Okay. Uh, now, Wesley taught that the natural and the political images were marred by the fall of Adam. So now, he's, you know, he starts out, humanity is created in innocence, they're created in grace and love, but then they fall, they reject God, they're disobedient, they engage in unbelief, and so now, uh, the natural and political images have been distorted by sin, they have been distorted by sin due to the fall of Adam and Eve, uh, but they have not been totally distinguished. But when Wesley talks about the moral image, he argues that the moral image was utterly destroyed by sin. In other words, in other words, righteousness and true holiness, because that's what the moral image is, uh, in the wake of sin, that is gone. The natural image remains in some sense even after sin. The political image remains in some sense even after sin, even after the fall of Adam and Eve. But the moral image, that being righteousness and true holiness, has been effaced or has been uh, totally extinguished, if you will. Uh, that's how serious are the consequences uh, in terms of sin. Let me give you a quote of John Wesley on this topic. And he writes, quote, For the moment Adam tasted that fruit, he died. His soul died, was separated from God, separate from whom the soul has no more life than the body has when separate from the soul. Uh, and so here we see uh, the consequences, the effect of sin. Then if we take a look at uh, Wesley's treatise on original sin, and this is one of the longest treatises that Wesley ever wrote, um, he talks about the consequences of sin and he is describing the Adamic state, the, the state of Adam. And he says that originally, uh, when Adam was created, all of his faculties were conformed to the will of God, that his life was in conformity to the will of God, and his life was in conformity, therefore, to the moral law. Um, uh, and Wesley goes on to say that uh, the understanding of Adam and Eve 
Uh, their understanding was sound. There was no corruption in their will, uh, no inclination, no propensity towards evil, and the affections of their hearts or the tempers and affections of their hearts were regular, pure, and holy. And so when Wesley describes Adam and when he describes Eve in the state of innocence, in other words, before the fall, Adam was happy. Why were, were Adam and Eve happy? Precisely because they were holy. They were holy. And so here we see that Wesley is a eudaimonist, that he is strongly associating happiness and holiness. Happiness and holiness. Very, very strong in Wesley's practical theology. Um, maybe we don't see it very clearly, so let's look at the reverse. Let's look at unholiness and then consider what would be that. So I ask you the question, can a person who is jealous or envious, can they be happy? Can they be happy? A person who is envious and jealous, can they be happy? Uh, no. <laughs> that in those miserable dispositions of the heart, they cannot be happy. They cannot. Because that is a departure from the grace and life of God. It is sin. That's what we mean by sin. Sin is separation from God, alienation from God, okay? And someone living in jealousy and envy is in separation and alienation from God. They cannot be happy. Uh, things have now been set up that they should be happy, okay? And so there is a very strong association between holiness on the one hand and happiness on the other. If you are holy, you will be happy. You will. It will be a, a rich happiness, a deep happiness. The kind of happiness that can exist even in the context of suffering. You can be happy and suffer at the same time. Not a contradiction. Not a contradiction at all. You can be happy, even joyous, while you're suffering. It, does, it, it makes no difference. Okay? So happiness and holiness are strongly associated for Wesley. And he's talking about the state of Adam and Eve in their innocence. Now, okay, what about Adam and Eve after the fall? What about Adam and Eve in the wake of sin, in the wake of rebellion against the God of holy love? And so Wesley considers that. He considers that. Uh, and so he writes about the fall. He writes about the fall and <clears throat> how the fall is mediated to the rest of humanity through original sin. And so here's what he writes about the fall. He writes, quote, Adam fell, Adam fell, and begat a son, not in the likeness of God, but in his own likeness, corrupt and sinful. Okay. So Wesley has this understanding that Adam is a kind of federal head, that when Adam falls, it is communicated to the rest of humanity in some sense, in some way, that his fall, the fall of Adam and Eve, it affects all the rest of humanity. In other words, sin is universal with but one exception. What's that one exception? Jesus, Jesus Christ, that's right with the one except, and that's precisely why Jesus Christ can be the redeemer. Muhammad cannot redeem. Uh, Lao Tzu cannot redeem. Moses cannot redeem. Nor any other human being. Why? Because they're sinners. They are a part of the problem. The only one who can redeem, the only one who can redeem is Jesus Christ, because he's not a part of the problem. Uh, he is not a sinner. Now, those other people that we mentioned, they are great people, Moses, Lao Tzu, Muhammad, etc., great people. But 
still in need of salvation. So only the God human, only the one who is without sin can redeem because everyone else is a part of the problem. Okay? So Adam begets children in his own image, which is corrupt. It's a corrupted image. We speak of that in terms of the carnal nature, original sin, which is passed along to us. <clears throat> and so Wesley writes, if the root, if the root is corrupted, then so are the branches. So if Adam and Eve are corrupted, then so is the rest of humanity. And so when Wesley considers Adam in the wake of sin, he writes that the understanding is now covered with confusion. We don't see things clearly any longer. We don't see good and evil clearly any longer. Do you know in my culture, I can only speak for my culture, people are now calling good evil, and they're now calling evil good. Do you have that problem here? We have that, we have that in the USA. People call good evil, and they call evil good. There's that kind of confusion uh, in our cultures. And so, you know, Wesley is arguing in the wake of sin, Adam's understanding is covered uh, with confusion. Uh, secondly, there is a natural weakness with respect to spiritual things. In other words, steeped in sin, they don't realize the invisible world. To them, it's nothing. All that exists is this stuff, what I can touch. What I can feel, what I can hear, that's all that exists. Matter, energy, that's it, nothing else. They're dead, dead to spiritual things. They do not discern spirit, you see? Uh, and that is an, a natural weakness. It's a, it's a deadness. It's a stupefaction, you see? Um, yeah, a natural weakness with respect to spiritual things. See, actually, Marx got it wrong. See, I'm going to pick on Karl Marx now. Marx got it wrong. Marx said that religion is the opium of the people. Did he not? Okay. What is opium? Well, it's a drug. If you take opium, what does it do? Well, it, it, it stupefies. It makes you, it puts you in a stupor. Your senses are are less acute, you go off, maybe you sleep, I don't know. Uh, you know, it's, it's the closing down of the senses, it's a stupefaction. Uh, actually, that's not what religion is, uh, but that may be a good description of materialism in thinking that all that exists is what I can touch, what I can taste, what I can see, those are the only things that exist. No, no. If you think that, if you think that, uh, you are living, in a real sense, a dimmed down existence. A dimmed down existence because you think you are simply a body, okay? And you are not. You are much more than a body. Uh, you are an embodied soul an embodied soul, and that soul has been created in the image and likeness of God. The body separated from the soul is a corpse, okay? That's what it is. Uh, soulish life is important, um, and, a, and the spirit can be in our embodied soul, and Wesley is saying that through sin, through sin, there is this dullness, dullness, stupor. We don't, don't understand spiritual things. Uh, at one time, a cosmonaut went up into space and said, I don't see God here. I don't see God here. God is not an object like a Coke, like a water bottle is an object. God is not a thing in the world the way a water bottle is a thing in the world, okay? God is spirit, and those who worship God worship in spirit and truth, okay? So there's lots of misunderstanding, and Marx did not understand religion very well, so we need pushback here. We do. We need pushback, and, and I'm willing to give it. We need some pushback here. 
uh, because human beings are far greater than Marx could ever imagine because he never considered the reality of spirit. Never considered the reality of spirit. And so, this, when you don't consider the reality of spirit, that's sin. That's precisely what sin is. It is this natural weakness with respect to spiritual things. Uh, the natural man's heart, therefore, is overcome with darkness, disorder, confusion. They have a natural bias to evil. Um, and there is an aversion even in the wake of sin to spiritual things. There's an aversion to it, an active aversion to it. It's not passive, it's active. Uh, an aversion to spiritual things. Um, and then Wesley also argues that Adam in his fallen state, uh, fallen in these many ways, was also overcome with pride, sinful pride, uh, turning in on his own life as the center of all value. Okay? And so um, Wesley will argue, uh, therefore, that the sinful person uh, in the wake of Adam's sin uh, is fallen in, another, in a number of ways. Um, and he expresses that in three ways in particular. And now he's thinking about human beings. He's not just thinking about Adam and Eve, but he's thinking about this heritage that has been passed on to the rest of humanity. And he says that the unregenerate person in other words, the person who has not been born of God, that they are an enemy of Christ. They are an enemy of Christ in terms of Christ's prophetic office. In other words, they resist the Holy Spirit. They desire not the knowledge of the ways of the Spirit. Uh, they neglect God's word, God's revelation in Scripture. They neglect the Bible. Uh, and they despise the preached word. That's what Wesley writes here. He argues, secondly, that they are an enemy to Christ's priestly office. In other words, <coughs> the crucifixion of Christ, the atoning work of Christ, is foolishness to them. The, they don't understand the cross at all and its significance. It's foolishness. Well, what does this mean? A man died on a tree. So what? they say. I see no significance uh, in that. Um, and they, uh, when they are awakened, they try to meet the demands of the law without Christ. And then the last thing I'm going to say here before uh, I take some questions is that they are an enemy to Christ in his priestly office, meaning that they are unwilling to submit to the laws and disciplines of God's kingdom. The laws, in other words, the moral law, the discipline, the counsels, the direction of God's kingdom. Uh, so that the natural person, the natural person who is unawakened, who is in this inheritance, this inheritance from Adam, uh, is unholy and wants to remain so. Is unholy and wants to remain so. Okay? Uh, all right, I think I'm going to stop there. I'm going to stop there and entertain some questions that you might have. Questions, comments? Question? No? Nope. Uh, I love the, the fact that you said that a jealous person cannot be happy. Right, yes. Like if you're holy, you will be happy. <coughs> Could it happen that um, happiness for those who are not Christians, if they live their life well and do good things, they can still be happy, but they're not holy in a way what we mean. 
Yes, I, I think I understand what you're asking. I think that a person outside of Christ can be a moral person and they, as we were talking earlier, can be socially respectable in the community, etc. But without this knowledge and love of God in their lives, they are missing out on a good which should be there. If you're missing out on a good which should be there, that's evil. That is evil. Because evil is the destruction of value, okay? I mean, we could even apply this in a natural way in terms of sight. Sight is a good, is it not? Then the absence of sight in some sense would be an evil because the, the good that, would, should, that should be there that we value is not, okay? Um, and in the same way, for the moral person, the virtuous person, though they are morally and virtually respectable in the community, they do not have the knowledge and love of God in their lives. They are missing out on this great good that should be there. And so there's this absence. Uh, and so that, that, is, that is an evil because that good should be there and it's not. Okay? Now, of course, they'll tell you, atheists, agnostics, oh, I'm perfectly happy, you know. But I think if you sit down with them and question them in detail. And the thing I would look for right away, right away, the issue of freedom and bondage. To see in their lives, are they, are they free? Are they, you know, wherever the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Are they a slave to nothing? I would look for that, and I bet you I could find, if I sit down with a person who says he's an agnostic or an atheist, I bet you I can find several bondages in that life that, that actually annoy them, and some there maybe even don't want to bring to speech, okay? Yeah, yeah, so, okay. Because who is God? God is the source. God is the source of all value. God is, God is good. God is, uh, you know, God is life. We all come from God. That's what the doctrine of creation is. And not to be in relation with that God who is the source of all of life is the missing out of a good that should be there. It should be there. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions, comments? Yes. Yes. Yes, what I'm doing right now, because I am proceeding orderly in terms of the order of salvation, yes, I am giving uh, not a historical treatment where we're looking at the context, circumstance, development of doctrines over time. I am giving you Wesley's mature views on this topic, on, on the area, you know, the definitive views. The, the ones that he came to after much reflection over time. So yes, that's a good question, and it's good for you to realize that. Uh, so this is what Wesley is teaching. So for example, you, you now have, in, in the Estonian language, you now have John Wesley's 52 standard sermons. You can read those sermons, and you are going to see a theology. You're going to see a theology there when you read those sermons. And, and that is going to represent Wesley's developed theology, where he ultimately came down on. You see what I'm saying? And it is that kind of theology that I'm presenting to you now. Uh, yeah. So not an issue of development, historical contextualization, but rather the finished view and best understanding that Wesley had in these areas. Yeah. So good question. Ooh.